Okay, the rock and chief cornerstone. Guys, I'm going to tell you, uh, when you look at who Jesus is uh, and we look at his names, it carries so much. Uh, I mean, there is just so powerful what is in the name. Amen. Obviously, we know uh, Jesus. There's no name above that. That is the name above all names. But throughout the scriptures, Jesus has a multitude of names. And I'm trying for for Christmas or for this month because I was, I was talking to a friend of mine and uh, and I told him I was preaching through the names of Jesus and he was like, you'll be there for years. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I'm just picking some for the month of December. And he was like, oh, okay. And, and because there's so many and it's so powerful and impactful in our lives, especially when we begin to understand them. And so the rock and chief cornerstone, go to uh, look at Ephesians 2, 19 through 20. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So obviously, uh, this, this is very specific. And of course, Paul's writing to the church of Ephesus, and he's writing to the Christians, because the Christians are not members of the saints. They're not citizens of the saints. They're not members of the household of God. Uh, they are the strangers and foreigners. But now that you're saved, you're no longer a stranger and a foreigner. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The next verse, 20. Uh, that is 20. My apologies. So when you look at this, you realize everything is built on Christ. Every facet of the word of God and everything about our life is built on Christ. And when we start connecting those dots and putting that together and begin to understand exactly what Jesus does for us, has done for us, and gives to us, being the rock and the chief cornerstone. So I listed 10 things. And, and I, as I was, <laughs> so funny, as I was looking at them, my notes kept shrinking and shrinking because I'm like, I got 10 and I got 2,000 verses. I better back up. <laughs> and, uh, and so then I'm like, oh, I got too many analogies. I better get rid of some because if I'm going to get 10 points done, I got, I had to get, I had to bring it down. And so, uh, you guys can be out of here by dinner. And so here we go. Uh, Jesus as our rock. Uh, and I've listed 10 things. I just took what I, what I felt would have been the top 10 that Jesus gives us as being our rock. And guys, I know some of you are struggling and, and I know this time of the year can be tough. Uh, especially with the loss of loved ones, uh, uh, a lot of um, separation uh, within families happened when COVID hit, and some of you had never regained that family back. Uh, sickness, some of you are struggling with some serious uh, illnesses that you never had before, and now all of a sudden your body's taking a turn and you're struggling with that. And so we have a multitude of uh, anxiety. Anxiety is topping the chart right now like never before uh, in society. And it's because of the, the uh, insecurities that uh, have happened in our life or that are happening in society. You know, we used to have a pretty solid country that when you woke up in the morning, you felt secure. And, and today our security uh, is gone, and and we feel like the strength of our nation is is teetering, and um, and we have we have a um, that to get you, and we have a uh, uh, we have a government uh, that is just wicked, wicked, wicked on every level, whether it's it's uh, uh, Hochul or or Biden, and and everything in between. Uh, they're just evil because their agenda is that of Satan and not the things of God. And so that just, that just creates this, this disturbance within us. And that's why I picked Jesus being the rock and the chief cornerstone. And I hope, I really hope these 10 things help you out. Uh, I encourage you to write them down. I encourage you to take notes and, and write down the scriptures so that, that you will have these to look back on uh, to, to give you strength. That's, that is my goal. And so number one, uh, he gives strength. 
And because, uh, um, you know, rocks are strong. Amen. Uh, and when when you need strength, uh, when you're weak and you're weary and you're tired and you're worrying and anxiety is setting in, uh, Christ provides strength. Psalm 18 two. the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Now, I, you know, I'm a word freak. I'm just or a word geek, whatever you want to call it. Like I, I love researching words and pulling them up in the original language. And when I see a list of these, I wanted to go back and say, okay, uh, what is the real you know, the, the real uh, definition of each word. What I was interested in or what I found very interesting is the Lord is my rock. And then if you go down and my strength, uh, it's the exact same word. It's the exact same word. And literally, the, uh, uh, he is my rock, because uh, when, you, when you start reading the definition of, of this uh, word in the Hebrew, uh, rock is my cliff, my boulder. Uh, my, he is, he is, uh, immovable. Uh, you can't, you literally, there's nothing you can do to him. He is large and massive. My rock is literally cliff, not cliff because you can fall off, but cliff because it's so massive and, and strong. And then my strength is rock again or cliff again. Uh, meaning that uh, once again, he, he is, uh, uh, the strength that is immovable. You can't move him. And yet our strength is in him. We, we trust in a God that cannot be touched with evil. We trust in a God that cannot be moved by evil and crazy things of the world. We trust in a God that gives us strength when we're struggling and we don't know where to go. We don't know. Sometimes we don't even know how to look up. Uh, I remember yesterday I was working and doing some things that I had to get done and I'm listening to uh, 96.7. Anybody ever listen to that station? 96.7. It's, um, um, uh, it's old school. Gives you, you know, it tells stories and takes you back to all this different stuff. It's, it's different. And, um, and, and I was reading uh, or I was listening to a story uh, that was being told. And, and th- the guy was talking about uh, his struggles and, and how, how, he, how he's like, I just needed God, but I didn't know it. And then he gets saved and it changed his whole life. And, and I'm listening to that. And it was just like all of a sudden, I'm, I'm all by myself. And, and it was like the Holy Spirit just, just, just filled the room that I was in. And I found myself, I just started weeping. I'm going to tell you, you get alone with God and you start praying and you just spend alone time with God and you get honest, honest with yourself because God already knows. And so you get honest with yourself <clears throat> and then you just confess it before the Lord. And I remember I was, you know, because in preparation for for uh, the sermon and 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 everything, uh, and then yesterday I'm sitting there and I'm just praying, and I and I just started weeping. I said, "God, I'm broke. I am broken." You found me broken. You love me broken. I'm broken today, but you're my strength. I was just we like, like crocodile tears, snot sniffling. You get what I'm saying? Like, you know, all that. I said, God, I'm, I'm just, I'm a broken man. But with you, man, I can walk tall. I can shout from the roof, rooftops. With you, I have strength. And guys, we just got to get honest we got to get honest with God and honest with ourselves. And when we do that and we realize that he's our strength and he's our rock, he is the cliff, not just, not just a rock. Now, how many have ever been out to Boston and, and you went and, and saw uh, Plymouth Rock? How many looked at it and went, are you serious? I just drove three and a half hours for this. How many did that? <laughs> So I get there, maybe I shouldn't spoil it. I get there and they have this, they have this big monument, 
built. I'm like, wow. And you got to, you got to trek it and you get up and you, you climb up. And as you're climbing up, oh, this is in my way. As you're climbing up and then you look down as if like there's this massive drop off somewhere and you can see this, like they built the world around this boulder. No. That's about how big Plymouth Rock is. The monument is massive. Plymouth Rock is. And I thought, I looked at my wife and I went, really? <laughs> Jesus is not Plymouth Rock. He's the boulder. He's the cliff. He is massive and strong. And we got to realize that he is our strength. And he's our deliverer and he's our fortress. And I love, he says, uh, uh, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my, my stronghold. And when you, when you think of horns, uh, horns, especially a uh, rhinoceros, right? No, uh, what is it that has the big horn coming out of the center? Is that a rhino? Yeah, yeah, I thought it was. Okay. Um, you know, when I was, before the service started, I was over there praying, Lord, give me, give me, get, Father, give me my brain back, please. And so uh, it's the horn, right? And, and the, the horn represented strength. And, and, the, and when you see that horn, it represents posterity, like just strength and position. And that's why it says, when of the horn of my salvation, he is everything. When you see him, it dominates everything else. And then my stronghold, immovable again. Man, I'm telling you guys, this, this passage is packed and he gives strength. Number two, he gives security and shelter. He gives security and shelter. You know, uh, doors were secured by large stones. Remember when Christ was put in the tomb, they rolled this massive large stone to cover it. And so uh, um, uh, security uh, from uh, any attacks or invasions, a lot of times were used by rocks or stones. In Psalm 71.3, be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. You have given the uh, commandment to save me for you are my rock and my fortress. I love the fact that I may resort uh, continually. You know, when we go to resorts, what do we do? We go there to do what? To relax, to rest in, to, to just take a moment to breathe and you don't worry about anything else that's going on. And that's what he said. He's our security. We can just go and rest in him. And we know that when we're in Christ, nothing can bother us. Nothing can take over on us. He's our resort. Look here in Psalm 62, 6. Did we get that one? If not, I'll read it. Don't worry about it. We have massive electronic issues with this program, and I'm going to fire them all. That is not <laughs> Psalm 62.6, but welcome. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. See, guys, when we are twisted up because of the world and the anxieties and all that that, that, that the world tries to put on us, the insanity of the way they think. I love this passage because he is my rock, that cliff. Remember that cliff that I was talking about? He is my rock. He's my salvation. In no other do we have salvation. He is my defense. Man, he is that line that goes up in front and nothing can get to me. He's my defense. And then... I love the last one that the psalmist says, I shall not be moved. Guys, when you're anchored in Christ, you won't be moved. And then Psalm 94, 19. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, how many of you, have, don't raise your hand, don't even speak out loud, but how many of you have a multitude of anxieties? Man, you can't sleep at night because you can't turn your brain off. <clears throat> Every time you turn the news on, it causes heart palpitations, but yet you won't turn it off, and it just builds anxieties. 
In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. And soul here is the, your very core of your, of your being, of who you are. It doesn't just delight my, my fancies or my interests. No, no. Uh, it, it comforts, delight my soul. My very being of everything I am, I take comfort and delight in. Number three, he gives salvation. He gives us something to grab hold of, guys, when we're in the quicksand of life. When we feel like we're just sinking. And God, where are you? What you? Sometimes, how many of you, you pray and you feel like your, your prayers just hit the ceiling? And you're going, Lord, and you get frustrated, right? Listen, there's been a few times where I've prayed and, and I've, I've had situations where I've went in and, I'm, and, and on the way there, I'm like, Lord, Lord, please let them see you. Uh, Father, please show yourself in a great and mighty way. And I pray and then nothing happens. And I'll leave and I'm like, Lord, you said, it's like I get, I get upset because, but that's me, right? He gives salvation and he's like, listen, I answer the prayers my way and my timing when it's perfect. When it's perfect. And so our salvation is in him alone. We seek his face. Psalm 62, 2. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. And then 62, 7. And God is my salvation. Wait a minute. Where's 62, 2? Is it the same thing? Hold on. Yep. That's right. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> my refuge is in God. You notice how the psalmist is constantly telling us that if you want peace and you want strength and you want calmness and you want deliverance, it's in Christ. Some of you are struggling so bad. But here's the reality. And, and I'm not even trying to hurt your feelings. I'm not trying to offend you. But some of you are struggling because you really don't give it to Christ. And you don't seek his face. You seek the world. You seek the things of the world. And they complain to God when it's not going your, our way. Right? Isn't that, isn't that what happens? And I'm just telling you, man, we have got to surrender. And when I say surrender, we got to surrender it all and truly rest in him and trust him. And when we do that, that takes us to number four. He gives stillness. <clears throat> There's a calm and a rest that you can't explain. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says this. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This month, I have taken more time than I would normally ever take of just by myself. Just me. As I go up on the mountain... And I just find myself praying. And I find myself just going, Lord, I just, <clears throat> I need rest. We got a big year coming up, a lot of things that I want to get in place. And Lord, I just need clarity of mind and I need clarity of thought and I need clarity of, of I, I just, I just need to, I need peace and I need rest and I need stillness and every time he gives it to me every time but it takes me removing myself from the crazy did i just go crazy i didn't i didn't actually mean that <clears throat> from the from the crazy rude from the from the crazy out right out in the world i did i, did, I went crazy <laughs> that's funny I have to remove myself from the, from the crazy of the world, how's that, and put myself in a position where it's quiet so that I can get serious about praying and seeking God's face, and it's quiet enough where I can hear Him. 
And some of you just, you never take, you never stop. You don't turn things off. Some of you can't be in a room without a TV or a radio or being on your phone or something with noise. And I'm just telling you, noise is the distraction. You need quiet. Stillness. Shut it all off. And then seek God's face. And I'm telling you, he shows up. Now, he might humble you. He's humbled me a multitude of times. And might put you in tears, and you may not like it. I didn't like it. I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm like, I, if somebody came in, I, but God, man, He, listen, He'll break you too, only to get you stronger and to get you where you, He needs you. He brings stillness. I found this story of a guy named Weir Seer, W-E-I-R-S-E-I-R. And he lived in the slums of Liberia. And he had heard that everyone was rich in America, so he stowed away on a boat going to America to find the fulfillment of his dreams. When he arrived in the States, all he found was trouble in the streets. He was arrested after a string of robberies and sent to the Kansas State Penitentiary. The first three years in prison were a nightmare. He was like a caged animal, abused by the prisoners and overwhelmed with remorse and shame. One rainy Sunday, Weir took his place in the Negro section in the prison chapel. Dr. Walter Wilson rose to speak on Matthew eleven twenty-eight, and And come to me, right? All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Wilson said that life is hard without Jesus Christ, and we become wearied and burdened. Wilson stressed that all who come to the Lord will find rest. Few of the men seemed to listen, and Dr. Wilson left discouraged. A few days later, however, Dr. Wilson got a letter from Weir Seer. Weir told Dr. Wilson that after the message, he returned to his cell and told the Lord, You told me to come. I am coming right now. Isn't that just a simple, beautiful prayer? God, you told me to come. I'm showing up right now. And God answers. I'm telling you, because it's with the heart. When, When we finally surrender, God shows up. It goes on and says, we are changed immediately. And soon the other prisoners were calling him the parson. Shortly after his salvation, Weir was up for parole. Now listen to this, because this just this is it's grabbed my attention and why I put this in here. Weir was up for parole, but turned it down because he wanted to win his fellow prisoners to Christ, which he did. When he was finally released, he was given a new suit of clothes and a one-way ticket to Liberia. Weir Seer returned to his native land and became a preacher of the gospel. He didn't find gold in the streets of America, but he did find God, peace, and rest in its prisons. He was so moved and had a chance to get out of prison, and he turned it down so he could win the rest of the prisoners. A changed life. Why? What changed? When he gave his life to Christ, he got stillness within and strength and peace. And he had a rock now that he could lean on. Changed his whole life. Guys, I'm telling you, when we truly surrender to Christ, some of you haven't done that yet. You you think you're saved, but your world is a wreck. And you might be saved and you're a prodigal son, or you might have played the game and you're losing. And I'm just telling you, you want strength? Surrender right here. And then he gives satisfaction. 1 Corinthians 10.4 says this, And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And of course, Paul is referencing back to the Old Testament of the Israelites. That spiritual rock, that spiritual drink brought satisfaction. Sometimes, man, you ever been so thirsty that you're like, if I don't hurry up and find a store and buy 
uh, uh, 93 gallons of water, I'm going to, I'm going to die right now. Right. And you're so parched and man, you whip in and you run in and your, your whole body's like, I got to have water. I got anybody ever been that thirsty or just me. And, uh, and then you start drinking it and you're like, you're guzzling it, man. You're just, and you can hear everybody, everybody within a mile can hear you. Right. You're just, you're tearing it up. How many have been there? You know what I'm talking about. And when you're done, you're like, ah, oh, because there's nothing more refreshing than a cold glass of water. Amen. This is the spiritual drink, and this is what we would equate it to. There's nothing more refreshing, nothing more satisfying than when the Lord touches us. The crazy thing is, though, for us to get that, Christ had to be brought low. He had to be abused, and yet he still chose to do that for us. Look here in Psalm 107.9. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Are you looking to be satisfied? You're only going to find it in Christ. But it's not until you're hungry enough to go seek him out will you be filled. How many of you, you've ever, you've, you, you've, people, you, you've dealt with people and they're struggling and you give them the answer and they were like, Okay, thanks for spending time. And then they run out and do the same brutish thing that they've always done. And they won't do or find or seek out what you've given them, which is actually really going to deliver them. Because we're crazy. People are crazy. Legit. Legit. Because we have the answer, we know what to do, and it's the last thing we do because when it comes to God, we wait until we're desperate and dying and have nowhere else to go before we actually look up. And then we get delivered, and then in our brain we're like, why did I wait so long? Because we're brutish. That's why we wait so long. He satisfies Psalm 103.5 who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The strength to fly and soar and have victory. And it's all in Christ. He satisfies. And when you shelve him, you just put away everything you ever need and everything that, that the only thing that can deliver you and satisfy you, you just put it away. This, 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 it's insanity to me. But yet we do it all the time. Number six, I'm rolling, guys. I feel like I'm right on track a tad behind, but we'll, we'll not catch up. Here we go. He gives stability. He gives stability. As our rock and our chief cornerstone, he gives stability. You know, that is what's causing your anxiety is that... that, that <clears throat> You, you mentally or physically keep living in an unstable arena. And, and sometimes you just, you gotta, you gotta move. Mentally, you gotta move. You gotta put yourself in a place in the rock. In the rock. If you want stability, it's not in the world. And it's not in the world system. Have you noticed? The only thing that, 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 that is, is stable about the world is the very fact that it's not stable. That's a stable fact. And Christ gives stability. 1 Corinthians 3.9 for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. And if you are God's building, he is the cornerstone. The, the cornerstone is what gives stability. If you don't have a cornerstone in a building, it's going to fall down. It won't last, but that cornerstone stabilizes the walls, brings the whole building together, strengthens it for whatever storm may come. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. <laughs> Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? In you? Why would God put the Holy Spirit in us when we get saved? Stability. 
If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Why do we allow evil in our temple? Whether it's the things you see, the things you listen to, or what you do, what you put your body through. And God's like, do you not know if you defile the temple, God will destroy him? Do you not know that if you continuously defile your temple, God will go, I've had enough, I'm taking you home. Why do we choose to destroy our temple and then complain about the results? Guys, I'm telling you, God gives us stability, but we have to rest in him. Because if your house is built on the sand, which is the world and not Christ, it'll fall. And some of you are crumbling right now. You're crumbling. But yet you refuse to make Christ your foundation. Look here in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man. A wise man. You want to be wise? You got to follow Christ. Who built his house on the rock and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock, the cliff. And guys, I'm telling you, the world's just going to keep beating on you. Satan is relentless. And he figures if he puts enough pressure long enough, we will crumble. But what he doesn't realize is I may crumble, but the rock that holds me does not. Verse 26, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. And some of you, your lives are falling apart. And great is that fall. And when you go down, you start grasping for others to hold you or to save you, and you take them down with you, and great is their fall. I'm telling you, you, you gotta, you got to stop being the foolish person and build your house on Christ and hold on to Christ and make Him your focus. Make Him your everything. Oh, well, someone will think I'm a religious nut. Well, praise God. People think I'm a nut. I uh, used to call, there was one guy who called me a holy, what, a holy fruit cake or a holy cupcake or something like that. And I was like, yes. I take that as a massive compliment. Amen. Listen, there's nowhere I go that I'm not telling somebody about Jesus today. And you know why? Because they're more desperate than they've ever been in their life. Ever. And people are dying. The death rate in America is up 47% in the last three years. 47%. Heart attacks, 20 year olds dropping dead just like this. 20 year are you kidding me? When did you ever read of 20 year olds having heart attacks? Talk about not promised tomorrow. We live in a day and age where our government's trying to kill us. You're not promised tomorrow. We have an enemy, Satan, and many have signed up to work for him. And everybody I look at, I look at as a soul that's either going to heaven or going to hell, that is struggling within themselves and dying within themselves. And how dare I be silent? To think that I'm a holy fruitcake, praise Jesus. Because if you get saved, you're going to love this holy fruitcake. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, I'm, I look at people. And man, when I see them, all I see is a soul. And I'm like, Lord, don't let them. It's not time to be foolish. So we need to build our house on the rock and we need to help other people get there because I'm going to tell you right now, people need stability. 
And if we're indecisive about serving Christ, we will be unstable. James 1.8. The Bible says if you're an unstable person, meaning, oh, I'm on for Jesus. Oh, I'm out. Oh, I'm on for Jesus. Lord, I think you'll do it. Ah, you're not going to do it. Ah, you know, like that, that, un that instability, you're unstable in your mind. Here's what it says, that you're a double-minded man and you're unstable in all of your ways, not just your walk with God, but you're unstable in everything in your life. And then it goes on to say, don't worry about putting it up, but it goes on to say, that if you're unstable and you're double-minded, don't think you're going to get anything from God. Because if you don't believe Him, He's not given. If you don't trust Him, He's not doing. And you're like, oh, oh, it's, it's all contingent with God. Yeah, absolutely it is. It's contingent with everything and everyone. Number seven, I got a roll. He gives unity. See, the cornerstone brings everything together. It unites. Believers are, believers are united in Christ, Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Let me help you. This does not mean that male and female are, are, are equal. We're equal in the sight of God, equal for salvation, but we're not built the same. We're completely different. Equality doesn't exist. Equality and moral values exist. Equality and gifts do not exist. I'm sorry. Men are just stronger than women. I'm just, why? Because God made us as protectors. Women, you're spaghetti brains. Men, that, that's, not a, that's not an insult. Hold on. Because some of you women are like, what? You're ready to throw something at me. <laughs> Men are waffle heads. That doesn't mean they're stupid. Men, don't look at me like that. Here's what it means. Ladies, God have, has gifted you as spaghetti brains, meaning you can multitask. Oh, my goodness. Why? You take care of the house. You take care of the children. You take care of the finance. You take care of this. You take care of that. And you're like, whoa. And men, we're waffle heads. We're like, hey, we're in this box. Until I get out of this box, don't bother me. <laughs> and by the way, this box doesn't bleed into this box. And so why are you trying to drag me into this box? I haven't exited this box yet. It doesn't work that way. And I have a nothing box. And when I'm in the nothing box, you got to wait. Because there is nothing happening in that box. <laughs> Amen. And you women, you women are like that set of train tracks where every track in the world comes together in that spot. Shh, shh, shh. They, you're like, what? Switching tracks and this and that. Men, we, we'd bust them all up. But you women, you'd guide them through because you're thinking and you're like, your brain never shuts off. It's good and bad. <laughs> But he, <laughs> why did I jump on that rail right there? Listen, God made us special. And that's what it means that you're not male or female. We're all one. We're united in Christ. We're united. We are one. Do you know what makes the Trinity so amazing? The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. They're one. Meaning that they'll never, they'll never go against the Father and they'll never go against one another. And there's no infighting. See, when you're in Christ and your focus is Christ and your desires are that of Christ, there is no infighting. You're one. You're united. When your household gets on the same page and the wife doesn't want everything she wants and the husband doesn't want everything he wants and the children don't want everything they want and they're all going three separate ways, tearing it apart. When you stop the crazy and you get in with one, with Christ, let's do what honors God, what pleases God, and what God expects from us, there's unity. That's what it means that we're, there's no division. We're all one. We're united. And then Christ unites homes, friends, and churches. Look here in 21, Ephesians 2.21 in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. We grow together. And when we grow together, we grow closer together. You ever see a bicycle chained to a tree and the owner never came back and got it? But the tree kept growing. And eventually you can see the bicycle, but you can't see the chain. That, that should be the church. That which brought it together 
was binding. But as they grew together, they became one. That's what we need to be in the church and in our friendships and in our homes and in every facet of our life. But we can only do that through Christ. You can't, you can't live like the world, be a part of the world and expect to be one with the world unless you are one with the world. And some of you join the world going, well, I'm just trying to get someone saved. No, you're just trying to help them to see that God allows you to do whatever you please. And they look at you saying, why should I be you or join your God or be a part of your church when you're no different than me? See, we're one. We're either one in, in God or we're one in, in Satan. But we're going to be one. And then Jesus, uh, Jesus united men with God, Ephesians 2.22. says this. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. We're being uh, uh, built together. Number eight, he provides direction. Guys, if you're feeling lost, overwhelmed, always confused, uh, seeming like nothing's ever coming together, uh, you need to get with Christ. He's the rock. He's the cornerstone. You know, the cornerstone provides the direction of the building. It determines which way it's going to go. Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. See, Christ is like, listen, I, I, will, I will teach you. I will guide you. I will direct you. I will make sure you're on the right path. I will make sure that, 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 you're, being, that you're flourishing and you're growing. I will do it. I will do it with my eye. Very personal. Because our God is a loving God and our God is personal. How many know who Corey Ten Boom is? Man, I'm telling you, if you don't know who she is, you need to write that name down. Don't Google it now. Please stay off your phones. Well, at Corey Ten Boom's parents' wedding, the parents adopted Psalm 32, 8 as their life verse. Later in their life, during the Nazi reign of terror, the entire family remained faithful to God, even while imprisoned in the German death camps. Sadly, Corey is the only one in her family that survived. After World War II was over, invitations came for her to share her testimony and the gospel. She adopted her parents' life verse as her own and began to speak all over Western Europe. She was invited to the United States of America, but when she applied for her traveling documents, she was refused. The Dutch official was hard as granite and would not flinch in processing her request. In, waiting, in, in the waiting line on another day, Corey claimed Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. In the waiting line, uh, she claims 32, Psalm 32, 8 and asks for God's help in the matter. Suddenly a man passed by and said, do we know each other? You are a cousin of mine. We've not seen each other for years. Corey asked if he was going to America too. He replied, no, my office is in this building. If you have any trouble, ring up to my office. Here is my number. When Corey got to the window, the Dutch official was still mean as ever. Corey slid the phone number to the official and instructed him to call the number. The official looked at the paper and his eyes got real big. Dialing the number, he spoke a few words, listened to the response, and hung up. Corey's papers were processed faster than a speeding bullet. For the rest of her life, Corey constantly bumped into the right people at the right place and time to pave her way around the globe as the tramp for the Lord. The verse in Psalm 32, 8 was her strength and anchor. And if you look up tramp for the Lord, you'll find a book that she wrote called Tramp for the Lord. And I'm just telling you, Corey Ten Boom was awesome, but God wanted her to go to America. It didn't matter how mean that guy behind the window, the, the counter was, and he kept uh, uh, pushing her aside, pushing her aside, pushing her aside, and God was like, yeah, I got the guy. Hold on. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Just stop by and say hello. You're my cousin. Here's my number. You have any problems? You just call this number. I love how she just slides it over to him. He's like, no, you call that number. Yeah, yeah, you're going to find God's words on the other end. Boy, you better get her processed and out or if you want to uh, 
stay employed. I love that. Okay, maybe it's just me, but I'm like, God, go God, right? Oh, there, here we go. All right. Number nine. He provides completion. He provides completion. In Christ, we know our past and our present and our future course. Man, I look back at who I was. As a matter of fact, yesterday was a day of reflection for me. As I'm crying and snots flying. And, and I was like, Lord, I'm broken. I'm just broken, Father, without you. He brings completion to our life. And I was driving and God said, I was coming up to the stop sign. And God said, whom much is saved from, much is required from. And man, I started going through my past. And I'm like, Lord, you love me after all that. I was, oh, I was so brutish. My decisions had nothing to do with anyone else but me. And God, you still love me and you still save me. He brings completion. Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it if we let him. If we let him. He'll complete us. But we got to give him permission. We got to surrender. If we don't surrender, we get overwhelmed with what's left. Remember that from last week? And then Colossians 2, 2 through 3 says this. That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Listen, how? To the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Guys, you want the full assurance? You want completion? You want it all to come together? You're only going to find it in Christ and through God. That's it. Nothing else. But he won't, he won't keep it from us. And what you'll find are the treasures. And I love how it's hidden because if it was in the wide open, we wouldn't search. And if we didn't search, we wouldn't come up with some of the things we come up with. Uh, I was asked last week, um, hey, can you tell me what names you're preaching on on Sunday? And I was like, nope. And it said, why? I go, because I don't know. Uh, I thought you have the whole week, the month laid out. I do. But here's what I find out. I pick a name. I'm like, oh, this is a good name. And so I start studying it out. And as I'm studying it out, I'm like, oh, there's a better name. Oh, there's another. Oh, there's, oh they got. Oh, and then I come. I'm like, OK, Lord, that's what I'll preach on. I can't tell you what it is because, man, I start studying. I start uh, uh, uncovering all the treasures. And man, I'm like, OK, Lord, you tell me. Number 10, and I'm finished with number 10. Man, I didn't know that I'd actually be able to get this done. He produces stumbling. A rock produces stumbling? That's what the scriptures say. He produces stumbling. 1 Peter 2, 6 through 8. Therefore, it is also contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Remember how I said all the way through, guys, Jesus is all these things. He's the rock, but he'll do all these things. But if we reject the truth, if we decide to be disobedient, then Jesus is a stumbling stone for us. Just like the church today, the real church, the real believers is a stumbling stone for the world. 
Because we don't allow any moral condition. We allow God's morality, not the world's morality. And so therefore, the church is in the way of transgenderism dysphoria. The church is in the way of LGBTQIRXWYZ and We'll start in the numbers later. Listen, I mean, this church is in the way of all that. But when the church becomes disobedient, they put the rainbow flags out front. They say all are welcome. They say God loves you just the way you are. Guess what? Now the word of God is a stumbling block. It's a rock of offense. When God gets in our way because he stops us from doing what we want to do to satisfy the lust of the flesh, he's a rock of offense. He's a stumbling stone. And I'm just going to tell you, that creates a problem. Romans 9, 32 through 33 says this. <clears throat> Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, they uh, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. They wanted to do what was right in the eyes of man, and they stumbled when it came to the Word of God. As it is written, behold, behold, let me get your attention. That's behold. Remember, it doesn't change. It never changes. Wake up. Let me tell you something. I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And so Christ is a stumbling. He produces stumbling. And some people stumble or reject Jesus. His truths create a problem for us. And guys, that's where we end today. Are you going to keep doing what's right in your own eyes? If so, the rock will crush you. Or are we going to give it all to Jesus and just be gut honest with him and surrender it all and humble ourselves before the cross and gain all the benefits that I've just talked about? Or is he going to be an offense to you? There's times you read scriptures and you're like, oh, I'm, no, I don't agree with that. I, who gives a rip? It's not up to you. That scripture is what God put in there for our learning. It doesn't matter if you're offended by that. He's not offended. He's just got to go potty. <laughs> Everybody, everybody's looking at him like, oh, that struck a nerve. Not with Chris. He's, he's rock solid. He's all in Jesus. But some of you, you read scripture and you don't like it. I hear people go, I'm going to talk to God when I get there. No, you're not. You're going to fall on your face prostate crying out loud. And if you're on the wrong side and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're going to fall on the floor prostate and then go in the fetal position begging. And it's not going to work. I'm going to talk to Jesus when I get there. I am going to ask him to hold Satan down while I kick him a few times, though. No, I won't. It's just a good idea in my brain. Is Jesus going to be your stumbling? Or is he going to be your strength, your rock, your fortress, the horn of your salvation? What you surrender to him will determine your answer. And if you hold on to the slightest little bit, he's still a stumbling stone to you because you still want what you want. You're not willing to give him what is his. Same way with salvation. Some of you, you're in love with the idea of what God can do for you and you're in love with the idea of heaven, but you're not in love with God. And therefore it begs the question, are you God's? These are real questions, guys, that we got to answer if we're actually going to make it through life successfully and with the strength of God. Or if we're constantly going to be defeated and beat up and, and washed away with the waves because we're building on sand. Doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Remember, we're seer. 
Get sa- he's in prison. He's abused. Get saved. Refuses. Refuses to be let out early because once he understood salvation and he was delivered and he gave it all to God, he wanted to stay in there and win his friends or win the prisoners, not his friends. Let me rephrase that. See, Christ changes your life. If your life isn't changed, you're not Christ. And you say, Pastor, you're judging me. <laughs> yeah, I'm judging you on the facts of the Word of God. You've got to make a decision today. Let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you and love you. Thank you for this day. Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises, Father. Thank you for Jesus being our rock, our savior, our horn, our, our, our buckler, our fortress, our deliverer. Father, all these things. Oh my goodness, Father, thank you. Father, thank you for not leaving us alone. Father, thank you for not giving us what we deserve. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you were willing to sacrifice your son for us. And then with all of that, Father, you have given us so much that we don't deserve. But Father, you just want to... Father, you want to give us so much, but you just want us to be surrendered to you. And Lord, I pray that today, right now, for each and every person sitting here, that they'd get out of their own way. They'd get out of their own brain, their own lust, their own desires, their own direction. And Father, they just seek your face and surrender all to you through Christ. And allow him to be the cornerstone. Allow him to be the rock. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have none of that which I spoke of today. But if it's your desire to do as as Weir did and surrender his life to Jesus Christ, it was a simple thing. He said, Lord, you told me to come. I'm here. And if you need to come to the cross, if you need to come to Jesus I want to give you that opportunity, and it's just simple. With all of your heart, with all of your heart, you surrender. With all of your heart, you believe unto Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so if it's your desire to surrender your life to Christ, you pray this prayer. Understanding the words are not magical. The words are not what save you. It's, it's, are these the words of your heart? That's what saves you. And so if that's your desire, you pray quietly to yourself after me. Father, today I surrender. You tell us to come to the cross through Jesus. I believe Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. I believe Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for me. And today, the best I know how, with all I am, I surrender all I am to Jesus Christ as my Savior, as my rock, as my deliverer. Today, I ask you to forgive me of all the wrong I've ever done. And today, I repent. I'm no longer going to walk in the way of the world. I'm going to turn my back on the world and walk in the way of Christ. Today, I surrender all. Jesus, you are my rock and my cornerstone. We at Connecting Point Church are excited to have you join us. When you come, you'll experience a friendly, lively, and casual family-like atmosphere that welcomes you as you are. 
Our messages combine straightforward biblical truths, humor, and life-changing challenges for you to learn and grow in God's Word. We believe in connecting people to Christ, to the plans and gifts He has for them, and with people in our community who share these values. We also believe in reaching out to our local area and the regions beyond. We're dedicated to being a place where your entire family can believe, belong, and become all that God intends you to be. Discover the abundance of life in Jesus Christ as you begin to understand the roots of the problems and learn to apply the tools for you to triumph over your challenges today. It'll be a breath of fresh air in this unsettled world.